rest of your family is back here, I guess you can find it. Yeah. <laughs> That's my usher ring. How's that?
Good morning. Welcome to Country Club United Methodist Church. My name is Blythe Jones. Please stand as you are able and join me for this morning's call to worship. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. We will pay our vows before the Lord. Those who seek God shall praise the Lord. May our hearts forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. All families, all nations, shall worship before our God. From you, O God, comes our praise in the great congregation. Glory be to God. Please join me as we read a couple of verses from our song of gathering, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling. Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, Joy of Heaven to Earth Come Down. Fix in us thy humble dwelling, all thy faithful mercies crown. Jesus, thou art all compassion, pure, unbounded, love thou art. Visit us with thy salvation, enter every trembling heart. Come, Almighty, to deliver, let us all thy life receive. Suddenly return and never, never more thy temples leave. Thee we would be always blessing, serve thee as thy hosts above. Pray and praise thee without ceasing, glory in thy perfect love. Please join me in our opening prayer. God of heaven and earth, God of the sunrise and the sunset, God of the highest mountain and the deepest valley, hear our prayers as we come before your throne of glory. Declare your message to us and grant us the courage to listen. May our listening turn to action. May our actions touch the hearts of those who need to hear your voice. We put our trust in you, knowing that it is well-placed in your gentle and caring hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. When given that choice, the choice is always mommy. We are going to get to meet somebody very special today. And why is that person so special? Adults, you can answer too. Why is that person so special that we get to meet today? Well, for one, she's our new pastor. Why else is she special, Emma? Why is somebody special? Now you're going to be shy. Of course you are. Um, she's a girl. That makes her special. What else? What else makes somebody special? You don't know? You don't know today? Ripley, why else is Pastor Angie special? Because she's your mommy, isn't she? But you know what? We are all special, and we are all special because we were created by God. And God made us all fearfully and wonderfully and unique and different. And today I have a story for us. And this is by one of my favorite authors in the whole world. His name is Matthew Paul Turner. And I love his pictures that he uses. So if you can't see him, hopefully you'll be able to. Um, we'll put it out in the foyer so you can look at him too. But this book is called When God Made You. You, you, when God made you, God made you all shiny and new, an incredible you all on your own, you unlike anyone else ever known. 
an exclusive design, one God refined. You are perfectly crafted, one of a kind. Because when God made you, somehow God knew the world needed someone exactly like you. You, you, God thinks about you. God was thinking of you long before your debut. From the very beginning, the history of time, you, little one, never left God's mind. God imagined your eyes, your head shape and size. He knew what you'd look like when you, or like when you felt surprised. He pictured your nose, all 10 of your toes, the sound of your voice, God had it composed. The lines on your hands, the hair on your head, every strand, God knew every detail. It was all planned. Out of billions of faces, out of billions of faces from creatures, all races, all people, God made different places. God knew your name, your picture is framed. God's family without you would not be the same. Because when God made you, this much is true. The world got to meet who God already knew. You, you, when God sees you, God delights in what and sees only what is true. You, that you, yes you, all of your glory bring rhythm and color and rhythm and rhyme to God's story. So be you fully you, a show-stopping review. Live your life in full color, every tint of your hue. Discover, explore, have faith, but love more. And listen and learn and relearn all that God has made for you. Use your talents and passions, the gifts God that God fashioned. Think up ideas and put them into action. Because God loves you creating, your true self displaying when light that you made through you is portraying, when make-believe stories perceived, the heroics, the magic, those tricks up your sleeve. When you dance alone, spinning like a cyclone, the beginning of whoever, whatever, a world of all your own. God smiles, and here's why. You're the spark of his eye, a familiar reflection that shines bright from inside. Because when God made you, the world oohed and awed. In heaven, they called you an image of God. Look at the bunny rabbit. <laughs> Isn't that funny? You, you, God dreams about you. God dreams about all that in you will be true. That you, God's you, will be hopeful and kind, a giver who lives with all soul, heart, and mind. A dreamer who keeps big and small things, who keeps dreaming in journeys upstream. A mover, a shaker, a lover of nature. A builder of bridges, you, the peacemaker. A you who views others as sisters and brothers and lives by these words, love one another. A confident you, a brave, brave and strong too. You being, you being you is God's dream coming true. Because when God made you, all of heaven knew, all of heaven's was beaming. Over you, God was smiling and already dreaming. So we're going to get to meet somebody very special today for lots of reasons. But the thing that makes her the most special is that she is a child of God, and she was created by God. And God called her for a very special purpose, and that purpose has called her here to be our new pastor. So as we learn about her today, we get to know that she is a child of God. In your bags, and adults, you're welcome to grab one out of these bags if you want to, too. There are these little cardboard people that you can decorate. And you can decorate them as you, and then you can give them to Pastor Angie, and they go together, kind of like this. And so she can have a little collage on her wall of all of us, our versions of children of God, and get to know us and our decorated versions as we get to know her. Okay? Will you guys pray with me? Show me your prayer hands. Not today? Okay, that's cool. Gracious God, thank you for loving us so much. Thank you for creating us 
in your image. Thank you for knowing exactly what we, you, we, would, we wanted us to do. We thank you for creating Pastor Angie. And we thank you for all that she's going to bring to our church. We pray that you would be with her on this journey and that all of us would be willing participants. Help her to guide us, help us to guide her, and help this church to come together as we enter a new adventure that you have already planned for us. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Let's special. <laughs> so thank you for um, welcoming. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name, hey, back there. <laughs> My name is Angie Colina McNeil. I am the new pastor here at Country Club United Methodist Church, and I just want to say thank you to everyone so far. You've all made me feel incredibly welcome, and I am so excited for this adventure that is ahead of us as we partner together with Jesus Christ and with one another as we transform the world and we make disciples of Jesus Christ. So I want to say hello to anybody that is joining us in the virtual online world. And also I want to make a special hello to the folks over at Kingswood. We miss you here in the sanctuary. I can't wait to get to know you. I know they've put up plexiglass now, so that's going to be great that I'll be able to come and meet you in the coming days and coming weeks. So thank you everyone for welcoming me here this morning. So Jesus taught us, when we come together, we should pray for one another. So at this time, I would invite you into a time of prayer as we lift our hearts to the Lord. Would you pray with me, please? Almighty God, your love is beyond all understanding. Your mercy is beyond our comprehension. You are the one who created all that we see, all that we touch, all that we hear, all that we taste. And you, you, O oh God, have created us in your image. And you love us to the end of time. Almighty God, we lift our hearts to you in prayer. You know us, God. You know us so well. There are times where we are captive to our sinful nature, to our self-centered ways, and we are ever so thankful that your love releases us. For those times, God, when we have turned from you, when we have not fully loved you, when we have not fully loved our neighbors, we lift those prayers to you now in silence. Merciful God, you have freed us to experience divine love in our own lives. You have forgiven us through your grace and your compassion. Your love has freed us for joyful living that is full of abundance and hope. For all this, we give you our unending thanksgiving and praise. We praise your holy and almighty name. Allow your love to be seen in us. Grant to us a determined faith and a fervent love that we might be reflections of your divine grace wherever it is we go. Hear our prayer, O Lord, as we offer our lives in the name of the one who is love, your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray in this way. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
This morning's scripture is from 1 John 4, verses 7 through 19. Beloved, let us love one another, because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love, and those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. The word of God for the people of God. For this morning's song of proclamation, we will all sing verse 1, and then left side, we're going to let you read verse 2. Uh, right side, we'll do verse 3, and then we'll all sing read verse 4 together. How can we name a love that wakens heart and mind, indwelling all we know or think or do or seek or find? Within our daily world, in every human face, love's echoes sound and God is found hid in the common place. If we awoke to life built on a rock of care that asked no great reward but firm assured was simply there, we can, with parents' names, describe and thus adore, love unconfined, a father kind, a mother strong and sure. When people share a task and strength and skills unite in projects old or new to make or do with shared delight, our friend and partner's will is better understood that all should share, create, and care and know that life is good. So, in a hundred names, each day we all can meet a presence sensed and shown at work, at home, or in the street. Yet every name we see shines in a brighter sun. In Christ alone is love full grown and life and hope begun. Amen. Thank you. Well, good morning again. My name is Pastor Angie Colina McNeil. It's my first uh, Sunday with all of you. And um, tell me this, is this kind of an awkward thing with the mask on? And how many of you have gotten used to the mask yet? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody. Okay, me neither. So um, I'm really glad to be here with you this morning. If you're joining us just now online, you are welcome in this space. And I'm so happy that you are here. 
Earlier this week, actually past two weeks, I sent out through the news you can use uh, asking for you all to send me questions because since we're living in this very strange time, I thought we would kind of mix it up for my first Sunday. I mean, it might as well, right? So I've asked Blythe to ask me the questions that we've compiled from the, the questions that you all sent to me. So we're going to pull up a chair and we're going to just have a cozy fireside chat and uh, just, you had questions about me, and I'm going to answer those questions for you to do. Thank you, Nicole. Let me grab my stuff. I do have notes because I am a pastor, and I love to talk, so um, I don't want to get long-winded for your sake. So <laughs> so thank you, everyone, for those of you that, um, that were able to send us some questions. So thank you, Blythe, for yes. being so willing to ask me all these questions. Absolutely. So. Welcome. We're excited for this morning to finally be here. Thank you. And I think everybody's smiling behind their masks, right? I think everybody should like, put like, like smiley faces on their masks. But <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for yeah, welcoming me here. So go ahead, Blythe. Blythe. Okay. Blythe. Question number one. How did you become a Christian? Woo. How did I become a Christian? So um, that's actually a really, really, really long story because it, it took a while for me to become a Christian. And I'll be sharing that with you in a couple of weeks. In two weeks, I'll be talking about my call story. And my call has a lot to do with my conversion, how I became a Christian. So stay tuned for week three of this sermon series. But, you know, I grew up, um, I didn't really go to church very much. I did go with my grandparents between the second and fourth grade. They are charter members at a church in Independence. It's called uh, St. Paul's United, St. Paul United Methodist Church. And I used to go with them from the second, between second and fourth. But in my nuclear family with my parents, we were more of the, you know, the Christmas and Easter crowd. So, and sometimes we didn't even go to Christmas and Easter. It just wasn't part of our family DNA to to be um, churchgoers, but when I was, I was probably seven, because I could read by then, and my grandma handed me the Lord's Prayer, so I'd know how to say that in church, and so I went there, so I know it was second grade, and I began in those three years that I went to learn a little bit about Christianity. I learned a lot about who Jesus was, but one of the most important things that I learned in that experience is that God is love. It was in that place where I felt welcomed, I felt included, I felt accepted, I felt like I belonged there. And, but the problem was is that when we moved to Ecuador when I was 10, we stopped going to church. I stopped going to church. My family hadn't really been church goers. We would go here and there. There was an English-speaking church in Quito where we lived. Um, but Church attendance was spotty. And then when I was in high school, I kind of experimented. I went to youth group at the Catholic school, uh, Catholic church. They had really cute boys there. So I went there. Um, but when I got older and I moved back to Kansas City, I went with my grandparents here and there. Um, and But when I was 19, I took this class in college. It was called uh, Philosophy 101. Have you heard of it? So <laughs> I took Philosophy 101, and from there on out, I decided that I didn't believe in God. I just felt like, you know, I'm 19. I study philosophy. I'm super smart now, so there is no God. But I still would go from time to time with them. And during this period of time, there was a lot of questioning in, in my heart, in my mind, and it was when I went to Egypt, which I'll talk a little bit more in a couple of weeks, where I had this overwhelming sensation that there really was a God and that I was going to start exploring that God. And then I started going to church a little bit, and I remember the pastor was preaching from Romans, and he said this, there is nothing in all creation that can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now, I know that's from Romans 8, 39, but at the time, I had no idea. I thought he was just saying something really clever, and it, but it made me listen, and I understood the concept of love. I understood that we all have this really great capacity to love, and so when I heard that God is love and that nothing could separate me from that love, something just switched. I had that that John Wesley heart strangely warming experience. Now, I didn't become a Christian overnight, and it took some time to become a disciple, but that was the first step, and I'll tell more about that first step in, in two weeks, so, so stay tuned. 
Okay, good cliffhanger. Okay, yeah. <laughs> no, that's very inspiring. Okay, Thank so you. step two, how did you decide to go from being a Christian to a United <laughs> Methodist minister? Well, that took a long time. Uh, it took about four years. Uh, but the, I will say it all has to do with love. You know, the United Methodist Church is the church that I mostly went to. My said my grandparents were Methodists. They were charter members. And it was during that time when I went with them where I felt that grace, where I felt that acceptance, that God, that they loved me, that the people there loved me. And I really, as I studied Methodism a little more, I really, really enjoyed um, under the way we understand grace, especially provenient grace. Now, if you haven't heard that word before, I'm assuming you probably have, but what it says is that God is the, the initiator of all love. And all that we have to do is respond. And I absolutely love that. It's like, it's pretty phenomenal. Even if we don't respond, if you have a friend that doesn't respond to God's love, we at least know that God loves that person. And I thought that was just monumental as paramount to why I was part of the United Methodist Church. And so then I went to, you know, St. Paul School of Theology. I wasn't quite a Christian yet at that point either, but I just kind of went on a whim. Somebody said, you're called. Um, and so I, I was a little leery, but I went, and I felt the same type of love that I felt when I was a little kid. And to me, it just became like this no-brainer. It's like, okay, well, I should be a Methodist because... This is how we love, we show love. I know the Methodist Church has some issues with the way that we express love. Not every United Methodist Church demonstrates love the way that I feel we should or that God does to us, but I think it's, it's a learning. We're learning right now and we're, we're navigating those steps as a denomination. So that, that's why I'm a UMC minister and I love it. <laughs> I love my job, I have the best job on the planet. All right, we're getting a little more um, nuts and bolts here. Okay. How do you prefer to communicate with the congregation? So, okay, that's a good one. I love to communicate. I love to talk, so I'm trying not to get too long-winded. But um, So a lot of you who have, might have met me through our Zoom meetings, that kind of thing, you probably know that I have a degree in history and I have a degree in communications from UMKC. Go Ruse. And I like to joke that um, I, like, I could talk about history all day. I mean, I could probably talk all day about anything. But for this position, both are really, really important. But it, when it comes to communicating with you and with our community, I always err on this side of more is not enough. So, <laughs> so you're going to probably get a lot of emails from me. That is the way that I communicate mostly with all of you. And I will make sure that that communication gets put out in our, the connection that Ann Vernon, that is you right there, mm -hmm. that the connection she puts together with Bethany. And then the news you can use, which uh, Susan does, so um, you will see that. I know that there are a lot of people that might not have email or access to the internet, so when there are those things that are really important, Bethany and I will work together to make sure those get uh, mailed out to you. Um, I'm a big believer in saving the trees and conserving, so um, the less paper we can use, the, the happier that makes me. Um, I'm sure Holly Mel will be the same way too, right? Yeah, okay, <laughs> I watched the Earth day um, presentation that you did. So so I will say this. If you didn't know about the questions that, that I was talking, that Blythe is asking me, those were in the news you can use. I don't know if I put it in the connection. Okay, I put it in the news you can use. So um, be sure to check your spam because I hear that a lot of those go to your spam just because, you know, bulk mailings, that's what happens. So, but email is probably the way I will um, communicate what's going on in the church. Or I also like to text message, and you'll get my, my work text messaging system thing. So, Awesome. Thank you. What is your favorite person, story, or book from the Old Testament, and why? There's a lot of good stories. Um, but I have this running joke. Every Sunday, I have a new favorite passage. I have a new favorite story, new favorite person, because I really get into studying the scriptures. There's always something fascinating. Like, you can preach the same scripture like five times, and it says something different. But I do have two um, in the Old Testament that I really connect with, one that I really like um, a lot. The first one is 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Um, it's the story of Samuel when he first hears the voice of God, and he's serving under Eli, the, the priest. 
And so just for a refresher, it's a story where Samuel's sleeping, and he hears, I don't know exactly what he says, hey, Samuel, come to me, come to me. And then he goes to Eli, and Eli tells him three times, it's not me. And then he finally recognizes it's, it's the voice of God. So respond to God instead. You know, and I could preach on this, but because it's a really good story, but because we don't have, how much time do we have? We don't have all the much time. Um, it's just one of the things that speaks to me about this passage is that there are times when we don't know when God is calling our names. We don't know who's calling our names. We don't know what that nudge is in our heart. And there's always somebody else that points it out to us. Not always, some people do know that they've been called, but for my, me personally, I had no idea I was called to be a pastor. If I look back on my life, I can see where God was nudging and pushing me into it, but it took somebody, somebody sitting in the pews, just like you, to say, hey, God's calling you. You're meant to be a pastor. And so I, it's always a good reminder that we need each other to point out these things in one another when we're called by God. And we're all called in some way to ministry, not just pastoral ministry, but the ministry of hospitality, the ministry of cleaning up the creek. I think it's a creek that I saw running right up there. So we're all called and we all have a responsibility to call each other into the ministries we see God calling us to. And of course, my other one is from 1 Kings 19, where Elijah hears the voice of God in a still, small voice. But I'm not going to talk about that right now, because we're going to talk about that in a couple weeks. So now you know the scripture we're going to talk about in two weeks. So, so stay tuned. Okay, same question, favorite person, story, or book, but from the New Testament, and why? Okay, my favorite story, well, I love Paul, but my favorite story is from John 4. It's the woman at the well. Y'all know that story? It's a great story, and there's a lot of reasons I, I like it, and we could do a four-week sermon series on all the different things that are in that, that tiny little passage, but what I love about it is that Jesus says this to the woman when um, she's, he's there, and he's like, give me something to drink, and then he responds to her. He says, you know Everyone who drinks from this water, this water that's in the well, will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give, wait, I will give, will become in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. So I, I just love that because it's, this is the fount of all of our lives. Jesus Christ is the, the living water, and it's through Jesus Christ that, that our lives are transformed into a life dedicated to God and lives that are abundant and full of blessings, whether we recognize them as, you know, the things that we have or just the way that we interact with the world. So I just love this story because immediately... Her eyes are open, and she goes, and she runs into the city, into the town, and she tells them, I have seen the Messiah. He knew everything about me, and her life is transformed in that moment. And the other reason I really like this story is kind of for obvious reasons, because she's like the first preacher, and she's a woman, so yeah, <laughs> go ladies, right? <laughs> so so I, I just... That story is, is great, and there's all kinds of other reasons that I, I love it. So thanks. Okay. Who is one of your favorite writers of Christian-themed subjects, and why? Yeah, so Christians have been writing for 2,000 years. <laughs> so um, there are a lot to choose from. I like some of the ancient mystics, like Hildegard is one of them. Um, but there's two for sure, and I couldn't narrow it down to one because I think they're both equally good. There's Paul Tillich. You will often hear me refer to him as my boyfriend. Paul Tillich is no longer living, so that's okay. Um, he's, my, he's my spiritual boyfriend. And um, he writes about, I, I like how he defines God. He defines God as being itself. So it's, he's not, God is not a being among other beings. It's not like human being, God, this being. God is the being of all things. And Tillich uses this word, the ground of all beings. So it just means that we are firmly established in the ground of all being. Everything that is within us comes from God. 
And I just love that because any time that I, I meet somebody new, somebody that I disagree with, I, all I can think to myself is, this person is also grounded in the very being of God. Everything around us is um, it's evidence of God alive in the world. So I just, I just love that idea of the ground of all being. And I do talk about that a lot, so however long I'm here with you, you're gonna know who Paul Tillich is really well. So I might even encourage you to read some of his books, but they're very difficult to read. So, <laughs> but they're good, they're great. <laughs> um, and the other one I have is a more modern writer, and for, unfortunately, you know, she passed away last Lent. Her name is Rachel Held Evans. And I love Rachel because she really exposes how the church throughout time, especially in our time, has had this tendency to not be relevant. I think the church is incredibly relevant, and I've never been harmed by the church, but she helps open my eyes to how it is the church in general, not just the United Methodist Church, has has been damaging. And she exposes why people are leery of coming into the church. And she's taught me a great deal about what it means to leave my perceptions at the door. I meet a lot of people, a lot of people that don't believe in God. But what, it, what she's taught me is that my role sometimes is just to sit and listen to people. And then when I hear where there's harm or where there's leeriness, my job is to tell them, even if we're not friends, I love you because love comes from God, and if it comes through me, they've at least experienced the love of God in some way. Like, and I know this congregation knows what that means because I got an email from Nancy Smith, who is at Kingswood, and at the very end of her message, she was welcoming me to the church. She wrote, my love is with you. And I thought, that's just really amazing. This woman's never met me. But yet she says, my love is with you. That's God's love flowing through her. So if, I think if we as Christians espouse that and just incorporate that into our daily living, then people will see that the church is relevant. And we're made up of human beings that sometimes do harm one another, but that we're working on not harming one another. So I just, those are my two big ones. Good question. Okay, this is a good one, too. Okay. In your opinion, what are the best ways for us to fulfill the Great Commission? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, I have uh, lots of opinions. <laughs> and there's, uh, I have lots of ideas about things that we could do as a church to be in our community and reach out to your community. But here's the thing. We're in this together. It's not just me coming up with an idea for how it is we go into the world to make disciples. It's about you, and it's about the way we share in that life together. So we're going to do something really kind of unconventional. We're living in strange times. Let's just be unconventional, right? Um, I'm going to ask you to yell across the pew or behind you, keep your mask on, what it is you believe this church is called to do. I know it might be awkward, and if you're not comfortable doing that, that's quite all right. We're gonna have my phone number up here. This is my work text number, it's coming up soon, or my email address there. Oh, not the work phone, but the cell phone there. That's my texting line, and there. If you have ideas about what it is this church should be doing in the world, I want you to send them to me. And if you're online, you can write them in the comments and I'll respond to you later this afternoon. Um, but your opinions, they matter. So I want you to share with each other, be unconventional and share with each other what it is you see this church doing to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ. So I'll give you a minute. It might be a little awkward, but it's gonna be great. It's gonna be fantastic. <laughs>
So well, thank you for sharing, and I didn't know how that was going to go, but I really appreciate um, you sharing with one another how it is you see this particular church reaching out into our community. And so I also remember, send me an email that uh, if you've got an idea, I want to read it because we exist together. We exist to do this together. Yes, I'll be the one that helps communicate what it is we're doing, but all the visions that God places in us comes from everybody, not just me. So you are... If you didn't already know this, you are a part of that visioning. And I want to make sure that we are doing this together because I can come up with things all day long and some of you might not be into it at all. But we exist as a community, a community of Christ followers who want to go into the world. And we want to make disciples of Jesus Christ. We don't just come to this building and say we've fulfilled what God has called us to do. We take what we've learned here in this community of faith and we take it outside the walls. You all know that. I know you know that. You've been going to church for a long time. This is what we're all about. You know, this past week I did five prayer walks. And I know a lot of people say, well, there's not a lot of need here in this community. But during these prayer walks, when I was either greeting people or getting ignored by people, I could tell that the love of God is needed in our community. We exist in this beautiful stone building. And I like to think of this, this building as a place where we come and we, we are nourished by the word of God. But we don't just keep it here. We don't keep it here to do missions once a week in the church. We use that nourishment to go out, to share our story to share how God is transforming our lives each and every day. So we're going to figure out together who we are as a people, and you all already have an idea of who you all are. We're going to partner together because we've been called here to make a difference in the world. We've been called to this stone building at 57th and Warnell to transform form lives in our neighborhood and our broader community. And we're going to partner with Jesus Christ as we help him build his kingdom right here on earth. Would you pray with me, please? God of infinite love, yours is the only love that has the power to change the world inside and out. You make clean the ones the world's eyes say are unclean. You make the mighty humble. You usher into paradise the one who the world's eyes say are guilty. God, we praise you that you first and last love us. Teach us, God, how better to love one another. Teach us, Lord, the truth of life. Prune us, tend us, so that we may bear fruit. And it's in Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. So we come to this time in our service where we would typically invite you into a time of discipleship through, through giving and through generosity. Just so you know, there is the, off the offering plates are right outside the door when you leave. Um, your gifts, your great generosity are what makes this church do the things that it does in our community. So I thank you for all the ways in which you have supported this church in the past and all the mission projects you have supported in the past, the ones that you support now and the ones that you will support in the future. So let's go to the Lord now for our final song, uh, which we'll be saying together. So would you please stand? Our song of response is God whose love is reigning over us. Let's read it together. God whose love is reigning o'er us, source of all the ending true, hear the universal chorus raised in joyful praise to you. Alleluia, alleluia, worship ancient, worship new. Covenant new again in Jesus, star child born to set us free, sent to heal us, sent to teach us how love's children we might be. Alleluia, alleluia, risen Christ, our Savior, he.
Thanks, Kyle. Quick announcement. The party continues immediately following worship. If you would head outside and there will be ice cream treats again. Again, always the perfect appetizer for lunch is an ice cream bar as we celebrate Angie and get to meet her and her family um, on the lawn outside. So please stick around if you can. Thank you. Thank you. I'm looking forward to that ice cream. And thank you for the sign. Did you make that sign out there? That's really sweet. Thank you. Did you all see the sign when you came in? There are balloons on it. Be sure to check out the sign. Blythe made that. So thank you, everyone, for um, welcoming me into this space. I'm so glad to be here. I told Nicole and Anne-Marie this week, I'm so excited. Like, I was nervous, but now I'm like, I'm so excited to be here and to be a part of this congregation. So thank you so much for welcoming me into this community of Christ followers. So as you go now, go in grace and peace. Go knowing that the blessings of God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Sustainer are yours now and forever. And the people of God said together, Amen. Go in peace. <laughs>